Well, good morning. How is everybody doing today? Well, it is so good to be here. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, I want to welcome you. I want to take a second, if you're here visiting with us this morning, I want to take a second and welcome you to Ingemar Baptist Church. We are so grateful that you're here to worship with us this morning. Uh, before... <laughs> mush, Avery, mush. <laughs> we, took the, uh, we took the youth, uh, the senior youth, last uh, uh, thir- Friday. It's not really Thursday night. It was 2 a.m. Friday morning we left to go to the Okoe River, and uh, that was an experience. So we got back yesterday. So if I fall asleep, Stephen, while I'm preaching, you are more than welcome to throw your Bible at me, okay? <laughs> no, uh, I'll tell you some more about that later. Hey, it is uh, good to see all of you this morning. Real quick, a couple of quick things before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, Miss Page, um, uh, Matthew and Page, I've been awake. Perry, they just had a baby. And they wanted me to tell you, thank you, everybody who has sent them food and gifts and prayed for them. And she texted me and said, make sure you tell uh, everybody thank you for that. So she says, thank you. Uh, Another thing I want to just clarify. So if you'd like to join the church, if you'd like to join the church, you need to speak with me first. So if you come down to the uh, invitation and uh, uh, you're willing to join the church and I haven't spoken with you, we're going to pray and then we'll step after the church and we'll speak and then we'll present you the next Sunday. So just know that if you want to join the church, if you feel led to join the church, just come and speak to me and mention it to me uh, beforehand. Or mention it to Brother Avery or Brother Phil or somebody, and they will uh, tell me. So uh, that's how we'll do that. Okay, any other announcements that I need to make? I don't like announcements, but I just broke my own rule. So the, the picture threw me off, Avery. The picture, Marcy photoshopped that, by the way. So. All right, then if not, I'm going to open this in a word of prayer. And uh, then we'll get started. Father God, we just thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for um, just the time that you've given us over the last couple of days, Father, to go and to uh, gather as a youth group, Lord, and to just experience uh, your creation. Father God, I pray, uh, Lord, for them, I pray that as they, um, God, as they, Get ready to start life as an adult. Father, I pray that they would stay focused and fixated on you and you alone. So thank you for this time that you've given us with them. Father, this morning I pray for our service. I pray that you'd speak to us through our hearts and our minds. I pray that you'd lead us closer to you, that we'd be drawn to you, Father, and that we would surrender everything that we're holding back to you and to you alone. Father, may we pour it all out to you this morning. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Ingemar Baptist Church. I'm Jacob Bagwell, and we're so glad to have you join us in worship this morning. Here are a few things that are happening on the hill. Sign-up sheets to volunteer for the nursery and children's church for the coming year are in several locations throughout the church. The Bible Tones will be in concert in the sanctuary at 6 p.m. on Sunday, July 30th. A love offering will be taken. Everyone is invited to a Back in the Saddle luncheon immediately following the morning service on Sunday, August 6th. That's what's happening on the Hill. Thank you for being here to worship with us. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. 
be ready to worship after that. Is that not great? Let's stand together and sing.
Father, we thank you for another time to come into your house and worship you. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, your healing graces, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Lord, I ask you to convict the heart of anyone in this congregation that doesn't know you this morning. Convict their heart, give them a clear mind to hear the message, to hear your word that's preached, that they may come to know you. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Feel the world is broken. Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Yes. Is a new creation coming? Yes. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Yes. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Father truly love us. He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he is 
can follow that. That's what I want to know. Man. He is worthy, ladies and gentlemen. What a joy it is to serve a God who is worthy. Who is worthy. It is such a joy to stand here this morning and have the opportunity and the privilege to preach God's word to you this morning. It really is. Uh, you know, I haven't said this in a while, but Brother Phil, you know, I could get mad. I could be sad, could even act bad, but instead I'm glad because I get to preach God's Word just a tad this morning. I am excited to be here today with you. If you have your copy of God's Word, open with me to the book of James. James chapter 1, we're going to begin in verse 9, picking back up where we left off as we're working our way systematically through this great epistle. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. You know, what is really quite sad, choir, if we really want to be honest with ourselves, is that life today seems to focus on the finances. All of life, all of our lives seem to revolve around finances. You know, we, we live in a world where people, their whole life, their whole life has everything to do with money. You know, I think it's gone beyond just a necessity. Look, I'm not against money, so to speak. You've got to have money to live. You've got to have money to eat. You've got to have money uh, to survive. I, I understand those things, right? The Lord uses money to provide for his people. I understand those things. But what I'm saying is I believe, Avery, that we're living in a society that has gone beyond simply using money but has gone to lusting for loot. We no longer see money as a tool, something to use, but it has become an object for our lustful, fleshly, sinful desires. You know, it's even worse that we find churches and professing believers and Christians lusting for loot. I mean, I can expect, I'd expect, I'd expect the world, I think we'd expect the world, the outside world, to have a desire and a passion and a lust for money and the acquisition of more and more loot. But we're called as Christians to be deniers of self. And yet, the people of God who claim the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their life far too often struggle and unfortunately do not struggle with their lust for loot. I want to start off by reading this verse, remind you of something. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says this, Paul writes, he says, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we say that we are a people who believe those words that are written there. We say, oh, we know that the lust for money, the desire for money, for uh, a gain over all other things we say we don't believe that we say we don't practice those things but in all actuality when it comes down to it i believe many people today have a lust for loot you see i believe that that stems jeff from a uh, the lie and that's exactly what that is is a lie that money equals success we look at the world, we look at people around us in our community, in our own family, and we look and we say, that person, they got a lot of money, they got a lot of wealth, they got a lot of loot, and we say, that is what success is. That is what the American dream preaches to our people. If you want to be successful in life, you've got to have a lot of money. Money equals success. Come here, I want to, lean, I want to tell you something. You guys lean in, okay? Lean in, you ready? That is a lie. It is a lie. 
Money does not equal success. Ladies and gentlemen, (laughs) money equaling success is a lie. And what I want to do this morning is I want to show you five lies associated with lusting for loot. Say the five lies of lusting for loot. That is a tongue twister. Five lies for lusting that come from lusting for loot. Five things. I've given you five points, so I better get going. I've got to hope I have time. Number one, the first lie that I want to show you this morning. First of all, let me read the scriptures. I didn't even do that. Let me read the scriptures. So you know it's not Brother Rob. It's the Lord. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. James writes this, But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Five lies that we're told that society tells us, that the world tells us, that the enemy tells us, that the flesh tells us, comes from money. Five lies. Here we go. Number one, the first lie is this. Money provides a sense of worth. Look at the person beside you and say, money provides a sense of worth. All of you just lied in church. Wow. Money provides a sense of worth. Look at me. Look with me at verse 9. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. Think about that. The brother of humble circumstances is to glory in what? His high position. That's an oxymoron. What is that? What? that that's contradictory. That doesn't make any sense. The person of humble circumstances, of lowly position, is to glory in his high position. Well, you see, in the context, James, he's writing this letter, remember, to the churches that are scattered around Judea and the region of Palestine, and they're a primarily Jewish uh, congregation that most likely the people have fled from Jerusalem, and now they're serving in these churches, part of these churches, and James is writing this letter, and the people there are facing financial insecurity think about it you've built your life in jerusalem and now all of a sudden persecution happens and you have to spread and you go to a different land a different city a different place a different culture and you've lost your job you've lost your wealth you've lost your finance you don't have a way to provide for yourself and so therefore you're struggling with financial difficulties and these people i believe not unlike People today, when they fall on hard times, were demoralized. They looked around at the society and the people, some of them even in the church, and said, Woe is me. I don't have a job. I don't have a way to provide for myself. And so I believe, Stephen, that the people had a sense of unworthiness they began to feel unworthy woe is me why do i feel like this here are all these people riding around on their fancy chariots maybe you know and here i am walking some raggedy tunic woe is me i have a sense of unworthiness you know that's not unlike people today who were poor People who don't have a lot of money, sometimes they feel unworthy. Well, I don't have enough money. I don't drive enough, a nice enough car. I don't have a nice enough or a big enough house. My kids don't wear Lululemon. My kids don't wear the nicest clothes. My, my kids don't have the nicest shoes. My 16-year-old doesn't drive a Maserati, and therefore I am unworthy. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. That is a lie. Your money, your social status that comes along with uh, your wealth does not define your self-worth. 
you don't believe me, look at verse 9 again. What does James say to these people? He says this, But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory, not in his wealth, not in his self-righteousness, what? but in his high position. What does that mean, his high position? Does that mean that these people in this church, they're going to get a high position? they got to work at a Fortune 500 company there in uh, Judea? No, it means that they are to glory in their high position. That is their status with God Almighty. That they've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. They are no longer dead to their sins, but they have a high position. That is, they are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And James writes and says, your worth is not in your wealth, but it is in your position with Jesus Christ. It's not your money that makes you wealthy or worthy. But it's the fact that you're saved. That is what makes you worthy. Ladies and gentlemen, money does not provide a sense of worth. You are not any more worthy if you have a million dollars in the bank or if you got negative a million dollars in the bank. You are bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. God looks at you as someone who is now worthy in his eyes. Not by your own accord, but because of what Christ has done. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got to be a people that look at people who are less fortunate than us with no less worth than the people who are more fortunate with us. Let me me say it this way as well. If you're that person that has negative $1 million in your bank. Maybe you need to see Dave Ramsey. But you are no less worthy than the person who has $10 million in your bank if you were bought with the blood of Christ. It is a lie straight from the pits of hell. The first lie is money provides a sense of worth. No, it does not. Jesus is the one who provides that. Number two, the second lie It's money increases status. Say money increases status. Keep on lying. I don't know what's going on. Look at verse 10. The rich man is to glory what? (laughs) In his money. No. In his humiliation. In his humiliation, the King James says made low. Uh, The Greek word there literally means low status. The rich man is to glory in his humiliation. There's many people today, like I said, that take pride in their money. You know, they get a fancy car and they drive around and they show off, they take pictures of everything, put it all over Facebook. Look at how much I've got put on an Armani suit, you know. It would be nice. This is a J.C. Penney suit, by the way. <laughs> but they put on their Armani suit and walk around and get $10,000 watches and stuff, and they show the world how much money they have. They boast. They take pride They beat their chest. I'm a self-made man. No, you're a God-made man. The Scripture says in verse 10, let me read it to you again. The rich man is to glory what? In his Rolex. In his Maserati. No. In his humiliation. Listen. Listen. When you walk around, here we go, I might get fired, Kenny, I don't know by saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's the truth. When you walk around and you puff your chest out and you drive your fancy sports car and you show, I'm not saying having a nice car is wrong, but when you puff your chest out and you strut like a rooster or a peacock and you show everybody all the fancy stuff you've got and how great you are because of your money, that is a sin. You know what it's called? It's called pride. And the Bible speaks against it. Let me read this verse to you. Galatians 6, 
Verse 3 says this, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We are nothing. We are nothing. The Bible says you're a vapor in the wind. Who are we to an almighty God? We're a nobody. And the moment that we walk around saying that we are something, we're somebody, we're big stuff, we're a big shot because of our wealth, because of our monetary and worldly success, the Bible says we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. Listen, you know what all this means, Brother Phil? It means this. It means that the person who has wealth, there's nothing wrong. God gives people the gift of giving and he blesses them for that purpose. Okay, I get that. Nothing wrong with having money in and of itself. But when you take pride in your wealth, you're taking pride in the wrong thing. Instead of taking pride in your wealth, you should take pride in your humility. Humility. What does that mean to take pride in your humiliation? Listen, when you come to Jesus Christ, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what do you have to do? Two things, right? What's the first thing? Somebody shout it out. Repent. Repent. you got to repent of your sins, right? You know what repentance really is? It's humiliation. God, I know that I'm a sinner. Woe is me, God. I cannot save myself. And then you trust in God. Repentance is really humiliation. It's a posture that you have towards your own sin. And so when James says you shouldn't boast in your wealth and your accomplishments, but you should boast in your humiliation. He's saying you should boast in that posture that you have towards God. Listen, I don't want to harp on this one. I've got to move on. But <laughs> People who are well off, which is probably every one of us here in this room. You got a vehicle. You came to church. You got a roof over your head. You got food. You're a well off person. This rich person that fits your bill myself included, we have a challenge to overcome. Each and every one of us have a challenge that we must overcome. You know what it is? Is that we have a, we have a harder time. We have a greater struggle practicing self-denial. Listen, you are called to deny yourself. It is really easy when you have the financial means to go, over, go wherever you want to go. You can get in the car and drive to, drive to California tomorrow. You can get in the car. We can drive to Oco. You can, we can get in the car. I can go out to eat. I can go to the lake. I can uh, just stay home in my air-conditioned, uh, a comfortable house instead of coming to church. I can, uh, instead of uh, spending time on my hands and my knees in prayer, instead of spending time in God's Word and, uh, and studying His Word and consuming it and ruminating on it, I got to get to work. I got to go make some more money, keep the lights on, keep the stuff that I've got, that I've built. Look at what all I've built. I got to pay taxes. I got to pay gas. I got to pay a car payment. I got to pay a house payment. And if we're not careful, All that self-denial stuff that the Bible speaks about goes right out the window. We have a challenge, ladies and gentlemen, to do what verse 10 tells us to do. Look at this. The rich man is to what? Glory in his humiliation. Don't take pride in your stuff. But take pride in your own humiliation. The first lie, because that's what it is, that lusting for loot brings, is that money increases your status. No, it does not. Does it just because you feel that you're prideful doesn't make you any more worthy in the eyes of God Almighty. Number three, the third lie is that money 
provides security. Money provides security. Number one was money provides a sense of worth. No, it doesn't. That's Jesus' job. Money increases status. No, it doesn't. Jesus does. Number three, money provides security. No, it doesn't. Look at verse 11. See if you can catch this with me. See if you can pick this up. Verse 11. For the, so James is now, he's using an analogy, okay, of the rich man. He's talking about the rich man. He's using an analogy of the sun scorching the wind and withering the grass. See if you can catch this. Look at what he says. For the sun, what, rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. You know what James is saying there? He's saying that it doesn't last. He said it's, it's that just like that grass, just like the flower that is there, that money can disappear just as fast as it came. Everything that you've worked for all your life could be gone. Just like the grass getting scorched by the sun. If you don't believe me, ask somebody that lived during Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, during the Great Depression when the stock market fell. People jumping out of wheel at buildings and killing themselves because they lost everything. All of it was gone. Look at people at different, Venezuela, very great, prosperous country. The next moment, it is gone. Every bit of wealth, everything people have worked for their entire life is gone. But for some reason or another, we are a people, we are a culture, we are a society that puts our security in our wealth, in our bank account. Always trying to get ahead in life. Listen, Jordan and I, I was telling somebody this, we were poor when we first got married and joined. We made like $1,200 a month, you know what I'm saying, in the Marines. We were slap poor. Poor. We had to, like, I had to get extras to go to the go plate in the chow hall so we could eat sometimes. <laughs> we were poor. And I catch myself always trying to have side hustles and jobs and these little things to do to try to get ahead in life. Why? So as a family, we could be secure. You know what, Jordan? How wrong we were. See, my security doesn't come. Our security didn't come from money. It comes from Jesus Christ. Let me read this verse to you. Luke chapter 12, verse 24 says this, Consider the ravens, Jesus is saying now to his disciples, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap. They don't have a side hustle. They don't have a nine-to-five job. They don't, they don't work overtime. They don't store stuff. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? Raise your hand if you believe that. Raise your hand. That's not many. You don't believe that? You guys don't believe the Word of God? That God will provide for you and take care of you? Raise your hand. Let's just do this. Wait a minute. Let me ask the question first for you. You know what I'm asking. Raise your hand if you're a heretic. That's yes, me. <laughs> Raise your hand if you have ever said in your life, I've been in a bad spot, but God has provided. Look around the room. Look, we, we, we've seen it in our lives. We profess that we believe it, but yet we spend our days toiling and struggling and putting our finances forth. And look what Jesus says, storing up, harvesting and reaping and sowing and putting up barns and building our wealth. Even though we know that one, God will provide, and number two, there is no security in finances. Now, I, I, look, I'm not the smartest cat in the group, okay, but... That just don't make no sense to me. Why we do that? Even though we know the truth. The question really is, is do you believe that? 
Do you really believe? You can speak it, you can say it, you can pretend it, you can do all of these things, but until you really believe it wholeheartedly, <laughs> you'll still always have that in the back of your mind. The question is, where do you find your security? The world tells you you should find it from money. Money tells you, the enemy tells you, worth tells you. You should find it from money. Scripture tells you you should find it from God. Three li- five lies. First three. Number one, money provides a sense of worth. Number two, money increases status. No, it doesn't. Number three, money provides security. No, it doesn't. Jesus does. Number four, got to move on. The fourth lie is this, is that money should be one's focus. Look at verse 11. See if you catch this word, okay? For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its, flowers, your, its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his, what? Pursuits will fade away. Look at that word. Let's read that last part again. Help me, okay? So too the rich man in the midst of his... In the midst of his pursuits will fade away. We live in a lot, we live in a society. If we are honest with ourselves, each person, there's a time in your life, maybe not right now, hopefully not right now, but probably a lot of us right now, the number one pursuit in our life is our financial gain, our financial security. Finances. They, they, they dictate everything that we do in our life. They attract our, all of our attention, the majority of our attention, our pursuits. They determine what we're going to do when we go to college, when we graduate high school, what we're going to do uh, when we retire. They dictate our choices, what choices we're going to make, what lifestyle that we're going to live. All of that is based about, around what? Money. Our finances. No one ever asks, what does God won't. No one ever asks, where does God want me to go? What's he want me to do in college? What's he want me to, job for me to take? What's he want me to do? Where am I supposed to go? But no, our finances are our number one pursuit and focus. They are. They absolutely are. what Jesus says, Matthew 6, verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. He says, You cannot serve God and wealth. No matter what society tells you, you live in America. The American dream is what? To come to this country, live a free life, and Make a lot of money and then work your whole life away and then die a happy person, right? That's the American dream. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. You love one or you hate the other. You'll be devoted to one and you'll despise the other. And my fear is this, is that churches all around this country, pastors all around the country, church members all around the country are putting out people, are producing members, are preaching from their pulpits, that it's okay. Both of them could be a priority in your life. No, they can't. Listen, your focus must be on God. It must. I don't know any other simpler way to tell you that. It must be on God. You cannot pursue both of them equally. You cannot. (laughs) One of them is going to consume your life. One of them, listen to me, one of them, money or God, will consume your life. It will be the focus of your life. My question to you this morning is simply this. Which one will it be? God? Or your wealth? 
Money should be used out of a necessity. I'm not saying you can't have comfortable things. That's not what I'm saying. But money should be viewed from a posture of this is secondary. God should be viewed from the perspective of he is primary. The world tells you that your money, that your finances, that your job should be your number one focus. And I'm here to tell you that no, it shouldn't. Jesus should. Number one, money provides a sense of worth. No, it doesn't. Jesus does. Number two, money increases status. No, it doesn't. Jesus does. Money provides security. No, it doesn't. Jesus does. Money should be your focus. No, it shouldn't. Jesus should. The last lie, and i got to go home after this, last lie is this. Money buys eternity. Say, money buys eternity. No, it doesn't. Look at verse 10 and verse 11. The rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off and the beauty of its, of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Listen to me. Money does not buy you eternity. i got to have health insurance. That's fine. It might prolong it. But it does not buy you eternity. Many people here in this room are spending their time, their energy, their every single day, working their life away for something that is going to be gone. They are spending their days toiling away not realizing that that one day they'll be gone too. Listen, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's really a tough statistic to calculate, but one out of one people, they die. Everyone dies. You will die one day. I'm sorry to, t- I'm sorry to break the news. One day, you, I don't care how old you are, you will die. It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. That will happen to you. It is a fact of life. Psalm 144 verse 4 says this. Man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. You will die. And I got news for you. You ain't taking anything with you. Adrian Rogers said this. He said, somebody asked, uh, how much did he leave? How much did the rich man leave when he died? He said, all of it. Every bit of it. You won't take any of it with you. But yet we spend our days struggling and toiling over something that is not eternal. When we ourselves, our, li- our body, not our soul, but our physical body, our life on this earth is not eternal either. One day we'll pass away. Some of you are making the excuse right now in your head and you're saying this. Well, I'm doing it for my kids. Putting it away. I'm building a legacy for my kids. i got news for you. They're not eternal either and either is that stuff. None of it. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. All of this one day will be gone. Gone. Who would build a house? Would you build a house if in 10 years you knew that a meteor was going to crash out of the sky and smash that house? Would you build it there? No. Rick McKay, you used to build houses. Would you have done that? No. Billy, would you have done that building a house? No, you wouldn't do that. So why do we build our lives like we're building a house where a meteor is going to hit in a year? We spend our days Toiling on the things that are not 
eternal. This life, this present age, this life you live right now is not eternal. Your stuff is not eternal. But you know what is? Your soul. That is eternal. The only thing that you will take with you is your soul. That is the only thing. So instead of spending your days toiling on the things that will be burned up and destroyed in the fire, spend them toiling and working and focusing on the things that are eternal. That is your soul. One preacher said this, buddy. Eternity is far too long to be wrong. It is. When you have been there for a million years, a million years, you will be no closer to the end than the day you got there. Eternity is far too long to be wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, money does not buy eternity. So stop acting like it. Five lies. Money provides a sense of worth. No, it doesn't. Money increases status. No, it does not. Money provides security. No. Money should be the focus of your life. No, it shouldn't. Money buys eternity. No, it doesn't. Jesus does. So stop lusting for loot. Stop lusting for loot. I don't know any, any other simpler way to tell you that. Stop it. And start leaning on the Lord. We're going to have a time of response. It's a time for you to respond to what God is doing in your life. You have this chance right now. Right now you have a chance. But you are not promised one more second. This might be the last chance you ever get. You know that? The last chance. I could pull out here on County Road 101. Somebody hit me and kill me. That's the end of it. Don't you let this moment pass by. Some of you here, you're finding yourself simply doing that, lusting for loot. Your whole life's focus is all around the almighty dollar. You're not taking it with you. My prayer is this, is that if you're here and that you, you would just get right before the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me of that. Forgive me of that. Help me live my life focused on you, leaning on you and trusting on you and you alone. Let money just be secondary in my life, but let you be primary in my life. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never turned from your sins and trusted in Him, repented and trusted, truthfully. Guys, get it right. Don't you walk out without doing that. Look, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you that. I'd say, just have a good day, go on. But I do. Trust in Him while you have the chance. Whatever God is doing during this invitation time, I pray that you'd simply just come and be obedient. Would you stand with me? Father God, your sermon, your truth, have your way with us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come?
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You guys will come up. So, guys, this is Miss Teresa. I think some of you know Miss Teresa. And uh, so last week she came and said uh, she would like to join the church. And so Teresa and I, we sat down and we had a good conversation. She's a retired police officer from Tupelo, so. That's what I'm saying. I don't, don't, don't run a background check. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. She, uh, no, we're so grateful to have uh, Miss Teresa here. Um, we got to talk, got to hear her testimony. Brother Phil was there. She has such an encouraging story. I'd love for you guys to take a second and get to know her. Welcome her into our congregation. So wait a minute. I did this last time. Let's, let's take a vote. All in favor that Miss Teresa come and move her membership from Martin to Ingemar Baptist Church, say aye. aye. All right, that sounded pretty good to me. So, okay. So, you guys make sure at the end of the service you come and welcome Miss Teresa. We're so grateful that you're here. Thankful to have you with us. Okay. So, guys, this is Josh and Katie Davis. You guys know Josh, Josh and Katie Davis, hopefully. If not, you need to learn them, okay? So, Josh and I, we've been talking for quite some time over the last couple of months or so. And uh, Josh was in the Air Force, by the way, so I had to get over that for about a month. But anyway, <laughs> once I got over that, no, we started talking. And the Lord has really, really, really been working in Josh and Katie's life. And so Josh has been praying about thinking that the Lord has been calling him to the gospel ministry. And so through these conversations and speaking and talking and much prayer on Josh and Katie's part and on our part, uh, Josh has surrendered to the gospel ministry. And so Josh has, doesn't know exactly what that's going to look like right now. He's a very gifted apologist. He um, is big on apologetics. And uh, so Josh has uh, taken a job with ICC to allow him more time and he's applied to New Orleans Seminary. And so he's in the pipeline to uh, go through all that fun and adventure. So, so, guys, what? Let's just give Josh a round of applause. I mean, <laughs> guys, this is a, such, a, such a big step. Such a big step. Look, man, I get it. I know Avery gets it. We, uh, Phil gets it. Stepping out and, and trusting the Lord. So, look, man, you don't have all the answers, like I told you, but you just... You walk with the Lord, and he'll show you. And so as Josh walks, I would just ask this congregation to pray for him and pray for his wife and kids, too. It's a big step, a big challenge. So make sure you guys come and pray for him, congratulate him, encourage him. And uh, Josh, we're just so, so grateful for what the Lord has been doing uh, in your life. Hey, I love all of you guys. I am praying for you. Um, Avery, you got a couple of reminders that you need to make, right? Okay, so you want to make those couple of quick reminders, and then we'll be this way. Real quick, we just want to, we're excited everybody came out and joined us this morning. If you have a bulletin on the front of it, it's a QR code. But if you're a visitor, we'd love for you to scan that, and you'll get a little free gift with that. Just excited that you're here to join us. Um, also, a reminder, Sunday school teachers, we are meeting and having lunch on the Family Life Center right after service is concluded. Um, Rob said he's going to tell more about the rafting later. I'm curious to hear what he has to say. All I know is that my boat got flipped, and I'm sorry for the others who are in the raft. That's all I'm going to say. Um, but other than that, excited that you are here and excited that we got to have worship this morning and just praising him. Hello. Yes. We're leaving tomorrow morning, yes, sir. Yes. Make sure you remember our youth. Uh, they're going to Infuge uh, in Mobile. So pray for Brother Avery, too. <laughs> I know he's wore out. So pray for him and pray for our youth to have a safe trip there and a safe trip back. So, Mr. Steve, Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the privilege of meeting in a beautiful place to honor and glorify your name. We pray, Heavenly Father, we met for no other purpose than this. We thank you for decisions that were made today we pray your blessings on Josh and his future. And Heavenly Father, help us to live before these beautiful children in this church the life that you would have us live as an example. Forgive our sins, Heavenly Father, 
Grant us safety as we travel to our homes and bring us back to your house tonight. I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.